Robin Anna Smith, also known as Grips, is an award-winning poet whose work has earned numerous accolades as poet and editor. And you can read some of that in the summary you were given. She's going to discuss exactly what Jay was saying, what creates a memorable body of haiku and how the poet's identity affects the individual poems. So it's all yours, Robin. Uh, okay, hi, I'm going to actually uh, switch myself off here in just a second as soon as I get my slides up so you don't all have to watch me fidgeting because <laughs> that's what happens. Um, again, I'm Robin, Griggs, whatever you want to call me. Um, my pronouns are actually they, them, uh, but uh, it's not a big deal if you call me she. I've heard that all my life. So. Uh, I just want to thank Jay for inviting me again and um, for everyone who's made this conference possible. Uh, all right, just one moment. Okay, I hope everyone can see that. Um, Full screen, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so as um, both Jay and Ignatius said, we'll be talking about um, signature haiku and how identity informs our poetics. Um, I've created this slideshow and I'll be honest, there's a lot of information here. This is probably multiple things in one. So uh, I hope people will jot down any questions they might have, reserve them for the end um, in case we have time. Um, but if not, I'll be providing my email, which is right here at the bottom and it'll be on the end uh, as well. All right, I'm not going to go into my bio, um, but I just put it on here because a lot of people don't know who I am. I've spent uh, more of my time editing in the past couple of years than I have writing, um, but there are a lot of people here that I have had the um, honor of publishing. I'm glad to see everyone here. Okay, so uh, this is my abstract, which you read in the... Um, the schedule, um, what creates a memorable body of haiku. And you know we don't usually hear a lot about identity in haiku, um, but we're just gonna talk about how we can't really take our identity out of it. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'll be including both haiku and tenru because uh, many of the standout poems that we see um, as Jay, uh, found in his study uh, include environmental nature as well as human nature. Um, and some ride the line between the two to where they're nearly indistinguishable from one another. Um, so just a little humor to start us off. Um, what about the rules? Um, obviously we have, um, you know, different aesthetics um, and goals that we try to meet in haiku, but there are a lot of things that we um, see some people harping on as far as, um, you know, can't include ego, must show universality, must be a haiku moment. And the reality is um, it's not, those are not always the case. Everything is very individual. So, um, you know, as far as ego, you know, we see, we hear about a lot of people, um, you know, don't want to see the eyes, the mys, the me's in haiku. Um, and certainly that's, you know, it can be an issue, uh, but the reality is 
Um, most personal pronouns used in haiku are a tool to reflect on an entire group. You know, you have to read the poem beyond the surface. Um, we can't just assume that these are egocentric, egocentric because of the single use of a word. Um, it all depends on the manner in which they are used. Uh, universality, it doesn't necessarily mean it applies to everyone. It can mean it applies to one society, class, or any other group. And given the international nature of English language haiku in the 21st century, where we have a convergence of different cultures, um, which all add to the richness of uh, English language haiku in general, there can be innumerable universalities. It's not up to any one single group or individual to make the decision as to what is or isn't universal. And lastly, um, uh, the so-called desk haiku, um, a lot of people um, have issue with this because it is considered to not be a haiku moment, which honestly is preposterous. It's also ableist as well. We um, many well-known and well-loved haikai poets have written from their beds. Um, there's a large percentage of poets in our community who are disabled. We can't all go on a ginkgo. Uh, and we can't just discount the experiences of these people or people who simply prefer not to write in a particular way. Haiku moment is just one option. Um, and obviously there are lots of rules that we can hit on, but I just wanted to uh, talk about a few that apply to some of the things we're going to look at in this slideshow. So when I talk about how, sorry, um, how identity informs voice, I'm not referring to what has become known as identity poetics. And that is just where poems are only about one's identity and the poem reflects back on the poet. And I think this is what a lot of people are thinking about with the pronoun issue. Um, but in presenting identity as the lenses through which we observe the world, and these leave an inevitable imprint on our psyches and translate over into our poems. The life experience as lens applies to both the reader and the writer. These are just some aspects of culture that um, make impressions upon us. Uh, no people, no two people in life have had the same experiences, even within families where demographics may be otherwise identical. Uh, because we all develop our own ideas, preferences, and inter interpretations of our surroundings. So whether we think we're filtering these out or we purposely write them into our poems, these perspectives and experiences affect how we see the world. So of course, they're reflected in our work. So people with similar lives to a poet they're reading may not even notice this in a poem because they're looking through similar lenses. And the further we're away from our own experiences, the more we may notice differences. Um, so we hear a lot about the work speaking for itself and that's true to some degree, the poem has to communicate with readers. However, as readers, we have to build some intuitiveness, uh, kind of you know, open our minds and be curious to see beyond the surface and beyond ourselves to not be too closed off to do a simple word search on the internet or search for deeper meaning that may come from a point of view different from our own. So for these reasons, we can't really speak about the best haiku or senryu without considering the author. Uh, if we assume to only read the work that speaks to our personal culture experiences and assume to label these poems the best, we assert our own voices over a wide swath of poets, and this practice erases the vo voices in the minority. Uh, it's simply exclusionary. So we should be reading 
as responsibly and astutely as writing. And I did not intend to discuss reading in this talk, but the more, uh, the further I got along in my talk, the more I realized that um, we can't really talk about writing without reading. And I, and I think that that is something that we do a lot of in this community. It's all, we talk a lot about how to make the best haiku, what does haiku need to have, blah, 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 but we're not talking about how to really read the poems. So this cross-cultural understanding I'm referring to here is simply how we interpret the work of others and how they interpret ours as well. So sometimes we're told work is not universal because one person may not be familiar with a topic or point of view used, but we can identify them if we take a moment and consider the possible lenses this writer may be looking through. And it may not be obvious in the poem, but we can look for hints based on some, some uh, things that I'm gonna show in just a moment. These are just imaginary examples here, some fake people I made up. So they have similarities and differences, um, but you know, do you think that the reader can find resonance in work of this poem because they're so different? And a lot of times we find that they don't. Um, but whether or not we share the same experiences, we can all relate to them. Um, via empathy, our imaginations, and subjective similarity. And subjective similarity is just what we perceive to have in common. And this in contrast to merely meeting halfway, where we only scratch the surface, or a, a hit and run reading, as I call it, um, where we're making contact and quickly move on. We have to slow down and give it more time, again, in both reading and writing. All right, oops, I forgot something. I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to this real quick. Um, so I wanted to just point out <clears throat> some ways that the, um, the empathy, imagination and subjective similarity can uh, help people cross over. Um, for example, this reader doesn't have to be a wheelchair user to have an idea of what being in a wheelchair might be like because most of us know someone who's a wheelchair user or who has had to use one at some time. Um, the reader doesn't have to have the same profession, pro, profession as the writer um, to appreciate being exhausted after a long work day. Or if this poet writes about her relationship with God through nature, depending on the way the poem's written, the reader may not even know this person practices a different religion, but they can relate to the concept of faith. So if we read poems that reflect a difference from our own lives and assert, for example, the experiences of disabled folks, LGBTQIA folks, uh, folks of different races, religions, and so on, from our own are not universal, we further cultural divides that other the people writing these poems because they are indeed universal and we should be reflecting on them as such. Um, and honestly, to do to neglect to do so is an inequitable action. So how do we read poems more openly in a way that we're more receptive to the lenses from, that different from our own? And how do we write poems in a way well, we can relay unique experiences to others without watering down who we are. All right, now we're ready for this one. Uh, so this is a list of style identifiers that I've compiled and these can be used um, both in writing our poems to create signatures and also in reading to um, be able to spot these in other people's work. This mean, the, none of these lists, because uh, I'm going to go into each of these in detail, 
none of them are exhaustive. I mean, I'm sure people will look at this and they'll be able to think of things off the top of their heads, um, but this talk is only so long and there's only so much space. Um, so I tried to hit on things that I could identify in the examples that we're gonna show. Um, and the style identifiers, again, are, are things that we can employ in our own work to help ground it in who we are as individuals. Now, of course, that isn't to say one can't have great poems just because they don't have a threading together of the poems in their body of work. But in order to create a signature, there has to be a sort of consistency between the poems. Um, and sometimes people do initially have this in their work, but edit it out to kind of sanitize their poems um, because they think that they can't have you know, these certain aspects of themselves in there. But in doing so, a lot of times they're robbing themselves of the opportunity to publish some of their best work. Uh, we should really be focusing on creating work that's more powerful, not more palatable. Uh, Subgenres, um, there could be tons of these, um, but I, I hit upon some of the ones that we see a lot of um, found haiku, surrealist haiku, different types of historical haiku, sci-fi haiku, horror haiku, femme haiku, as coined by Lori Minor. Um, and, and a lot of people write in numerous subgenres um, and, and all of these different categories. It's not like people just pick one thing and that's all that they do. But a lot of times you can find groups of their poems and that fall within these. And when you're writing, you know, it's just like when you create a book, you want there to be something that's connecting all of those things together. Um, and really that's, you know, to create things that are memorable, there are, you know, sometimes you might write a, read a poem and you know when you read the poem, you have, might have an idea of who it is because they have such a strong style. Um, topics, there could be innumerable topics, of course, um, but some we see a lot of are science, arts, um, things that are specific to culture, uh, things that are specific to location, social issues and relationships. Um, and form. Um, there are some people who consistently write in an alternate form to the tercet. I mean, uh, haiku is more of a genre than a form, so there's really no reason that we have to feel constrained to using three lines. Um, but using alternate lineation or concrete forms uh, can be a uh, can help someone um, more precisely express what it is they're trying to say uh, versus trying to figure out a way to you know cram it into a three line format with short long short or whatever and also um, I wanted to include Haiga and Shahai here because uh, a lot of people um, really enjoy that. I, unfortunately, I don't feel like we see enough of that. I'd love to see more. Okay, uh, specificity, there's a lot more on here um, than some of the other slides, but uh, it's basically writing in, in specific relation to something else. And that can be a, a physical or mental state, um, just someone's, personality, aspects of their personality um, related to roles, hobbies, their occupation or personal interests. Um, you know, a collection of sports haiku or whatever, just as an example. Manipulation of language is something we see a lot of in EQ. Uh, I personally think it's, these are things that can really make a good haiku um, amazing. Uh, 
abstraction is just, um, well, it, it just, uh, it can be a lot of different things, honestly. It can be um, the, the situation framing is abstract or it can be the way that your words are moved around in an abstract manner. Um, turn of phrase is really just the unique or unusual way the words are used. Um, the situa situation framing is the way you're setting up for the reader to, is the position you're putting the reader in essentially. Um, you may be putting them in a different uh, perspective than what they would normally look at the world in. Neurodiverse communication styles are really um, anything that can affect the way uh, people access memory and vocabulary and general cognition, uh, the use of poetic devices and um, mixing in non-English words. And these can be uh, Latin words, you know, for plants or whatever, or it could also be, um, you know, from your native tongue. Uh, but all those things can add a personal flavor to Haiku. Um, these are the eight poets. We'll be um, reading some of their work. And uh, I, I basically selected these poets uh, because they all have strong signatures. And uh, although we're not gonna hit on all their signatures today, but a handful of them. Um, and they were significantly different from each other. So we'd have a good variety of identifiers we could look at. Um, and I also wanted my selections to represent a range of experience in both writing and in life in general. So our first poet we're gonna look at is Hibsa Ashraf. Um, and I'd like to have us think back to the previous slide where it's talking about the use of the pronouns not being egocentric necessarily. Um, and let's read this uh, first poem here, Patriarchal Shadow, Overstepping My Double Helix. So obviously this poem does not reflect only on this individual. It represents the patriarchal culture as a whole. It can re represent any individual who's been, uh, had their life prescribed by an individual man. It could include non-binary people, trans people, gay men as well. And that's about half the population. So we really need to look at the way the word is used when someone's using a pronoun. Um, now looking at her identifiers, which I've got listed under a picture. Uh, and again, I, I may have missed some, I just tried to hit on the ones that I found were the strongest here. Um, personal history, um, although again, when someone is using uh, the pronouns, it doesn't necessarily mean it's them, but I'm including that because it has to do with the way it's read. Someone may read it as only being personal to her. Um, there's a strong uh, feminist undertone here. She hits on topics of mental health and some culture specific uh, topics. She uses alternate lineation um, on this poem over here, layer after layer after layer of black fog, delirium. Um, she's used the line breaks and the space to really add another layer to, no pun intended, um, uh, to what she's trying to say in the poem. And yes, it has five lines and no, it's not a tonka. Um, uh, and let's see, uh, poetic devices, just, you know, uh, some alliteration uh, and assonance here.
And again, um, this is an example of someone using both Haiku and Senru where they kind of blend together. Oops, shoot, sorry. Um, the late Jan Benson um, had very uh, strong natural and personal histories in, in her uh, body of work. Um, a lot of scientific topics that she um, would reflect on. Uh, and she was really a master of manipulation of language. Um, she did have neurocognitive difference due to brain injury. Um, and I believe that, that that played into her use of turn of phrase, situation framing, um, and her, her specific vocabulary. It was just the way she used the words that were unique. Next is uh, Susan Birch and um, On her identifiers, obviously there are um, the, the topics, relationships are one thing. Sorry, I keep. Um, humor, uh, Coke bottles with names, who do I want to be today? Uh, and imagination. Um, Zen garden and imaginary river runs through me. She's actually putting her imagination straight into the poem. Um, mental state, uh, punctuation, we can see most of these have an N dash, uh, which may not seem significant, but it still plays into the signature. Um, and something I didn't have on the previous slide, uh, but is another way that she's manipulate, manipulated the language in the haiku is uh, the use of casual language, hell bent on talking to you, um, looking for love in all the wrong places, and so on. So uh, again, like I said, I, I can't um, hit on every aspect of everyone's signatures here, but I just wanted to create some examples. Um, for Kat, I'm using her Sudoku, which are only one facet of her work, but I wanted to feature something that was highly experimental, but also extremely effective. Um, if you haven't seen these before, they're intended to be read uh, vertically and horizontally, but a lot of people have also said they find poems diagonally um, or also even like uh, playing bingo, just selecting uh, words and phrases um, just randomly around these boards. Um, but if we look at the individual poems, we can still pick out the signatures. Um, there's a natural and personal histories here. Um, obviously she's used her imagination because uh, as we read edges of the night hours, zombies grazing, I don't think she experienced that in real life. Um, and again, uh, situation framing, abstraction. I was going to read just one moment. I lost what I, I lost what was in my head. Um, also the precise use of language and punctuation. Um, monster soliloquies beneath our brains sometimes.
All right, I'm just going to give another minute here for people to try to find some more poems. Okay. Uh, the next poet we'll be looking at is Reka Nyetrai. Um, anyone familiar with her work is probably familiar with a lot of her, the surrealism that she uses. Um, Winter Sky, The Aftertaste of a White Lie, Lullaby in Her Mouth, swarming fireflies. Um, she does use some alternate lineations, um, roles. Um, here she's talked about her mother and her ex-lover. Um, and um, different types of manipulation of language. Um, I wanted to use this as an example also of multiple readings in the one-liners. Um, because they can have breaks in a variety of places, which is also another way to manipulate the poem. Okay, next is Vandana Parasha. Uh, she also kind of rides the line between haiku and senru, almost blending them together. We can see um, personal history here, uh, but she still uses a lot of uh, nature images. Um, intra and interpersonal relationships here, um, reflecting inside and outside. Um, roles here as this in this ex, these examples it's it's as a mother um her mental state um well not necessarily her obviously the universality of this as writing for mothers or people who have experienced this you know postpartum the sky finally clears of last night's storm reflection of a mental state um and uh, the situation framing, um, slipping to the wrong side of 40s, uh, is something that you can visualize even though it's not something physical. Uh, next is Oren Tyrell Prejean, who also publishes under Matsukaze. Um, one thing that's interesting about when I was picking out these poems, um, I, I was looking for things that were going to um, <clears throat> be an example of the delicateness um, with which he writes and um, I didn't even realize all of these had flowers in them until I had them all on the slide. So I think that that is an interesting thing. You know, a lot of times when we're reading, we don't even recognize some of these things. And additionally, while, while we're writing, um, it's probably harder to see these um, identifiers in our own work and see the threads that are putting things, you know, kind of connecting things. Um, than it is for us to see them in other people's work. But as we can see, um, personal histories, obviously, um, I put societal, the, the collapsing city could be, um, depending on how you read it. <clears throat> um, and intra and interpersonal relationships, um, reflecting back on himself, as well as interacting with others. Um, he has said um, 
he writes all of this work person first. So even though we may read a lot of these as haiku, he considers them senru um, because the most important part of it to him is uh, the human aspect. But again, as uh, you know, as Jay was saying yesterday, that a lot of the poems that they found that they liked the best were um, in the contests or whatever. Um, did have aspects of both of those married together. And a lot of times, um, I know in my own work and in um, trying to analyze the work of others as an editor, a lot of times it's, it's hard to figure out which category they put the, to put these in because um, Sandra don't have to be funny. Uh, so I'll just give you a second to look at some of those. I go on. All right. Um, our last example is Shloka Shankar. Um, obviously, there's personal history in here. Um, yeah, but again, these pronouns, I, is not necessarily um, her. It could be anyone. Um, she does use a lot of musical references. Uh, references to grammatical terms. Um, but really, to me, the strongest part of uh, her work is her manipulation of the language. You know, the simulacrum of memory, I relapse into a coda, I shapeshift into a key inside the wall of winter. These are kind of things that um, when you read them, they feel familiar, even though they're not. It's like deja vu or an earworm, something that gets down in your subconscious. And the reason it has resonance, even though you might not really even understand what it means, is because it has that feeling of familiarity. And I'm just showing one example of collaboration because collaboration is another way to add more layers, um, crossing over of personal lenses to create deeper meaning or additional resonance. And collaborations also can have signatures. Um, anyone who's read uh, the split sequences of uh, Brian Rickert and Peter Dostermsky or Tanya McDonald's and Lou Watts's Renge, um, you know that there are certain things that you can look forward to seeing when you read the work. So going back to this slide, where we see the reader and the poet overlap. Can you see any more potential for resonance here? You know, the choices people make when writing are inevitably influenced by their identities. Um, so meeting the poet in the middle really isn't enough. We have to look deeper, um, go beyond. We can't just skim or meet halfway. Uh, and in the middle uh, where the overlap is, the empathy, the imagination, the subjective similarity, these things are the glue that kind of hold all these lenses together um, and allow the reader to be pulled into the poem and remain there long enough to look deeper. So as a reader, uh, what can we do to meet, to go beyond meeting the poem halfway? How can we keep our eyes and our mind open to look for these things that are kind of lying be beneath the surface waiting to make a connection? And how do you use the reading of each haiku as an opportunity to learn? And again, this applies to editing and judging as well. You know, uh, because you don't get 
a poem accepted somewhere, it doesn't mean it's not a good poem. It just means it's not a good fit. And that's why you need to just keep sending it back out. And uh, on the other side, as editors and judges, we have to be aware of our positions and make sure that we are reading deeply enough. Um, as a writer, what can you bring to haiku or sundry that no one else can because no one else is you? Um, you know, we don't want to be all writing the same poem because there would be no, nothing interesting in that. Um, using the style identifiers, what do you think your personal signatures are? And what other identifiers can you spot that I didn't have space to put on here? <laughs> um, and how can you use your background and personality to communicate in a unique manner, thus creating a memorable body of work? You know, um, where were you born? Uh, did you grow up in a small town? Um, what kind of jobs have you held? All of these things um, affect us. So we are poets writing poems. Seems obvious, right? But we have to remember writing is an art form and art, no matter its topic, always includes the artist somewhere in the work. So we need to not forget that when we're writing. And that is it. Uh, I guess it's a good thing uh, they went over a little bit because I went way too fast. But I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, if you want to contact me with any questions, um, if you want a, a copy of the presentation, I think they might have be putting it up on HSA. I'm also going to put it on my uh, website. And I also wanted to share, because I don't think I mentioned at the beginning, the, our Trailblazer contest uh, will be starting up in August. So it's not that far off. Um, definitely check it out. We have a great group of 10 judges for this. All right, I think, <laughs> I think I'm back. I can't figure out how to get, oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Well, I had to put much. that over because it kept popping up with the people coming in. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Robin. That was wonderful. Lots uh, of thank you. There. We have plenty of time if we have people that want to uh, ask questions. I didn't notice any direct questions to you in the chat that they went by. If people have them, just you can either send it in or just let us know that they unmute themselves and ask you the question. Yeah, go for it. Question, I missed your um, website and I really want to find that. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. It is, um, it's G-R-I-X. Uh, gosh, I don't know how to spell. I got to write it out. <laughs> I got to write it out. It's artistics, but it's an F X. Um, a R T I S T I X dot com. Thank you. This was really wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I, pre I appreciate everyone showing up and, and listening to me. <laughs> thank you so much. And just a reminder we are recording this so that shortly after. The conference it will be available as individual sessions on our youtube website lots of food for Fantastic. thought uh, thank you yeah that was brilliant tricks amazing really necessary to expand the boundary of what gets written about and who gets to write it 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we have to work at editors too. Editors have a tendency to fall into a certain group or they tend to develop a pattern. And when something comes that's a little bit out of their comfort zone, they ignore it offhand right. without looking at it as the value of it as a poem. Correct. Yes. Agreed. Make us uncomfortable. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's well, as, uh, as one just, of the editors uh, of Failed Haiku, I can tell you that I'm open for this and I have Grix's back. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. That's just about the best presentation I've heard in a really long time. That was <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So I appreciate that. Outstanding. <laughs> Thank you for enabling uh, us. Yeah. Hi, uh, I, I, I'm June from Japan. Hi. And that, yeah, thank you for your uh, <laughs> presentation. And I, I noticed that you know, uh, even the Masaoka Shiki and uh, and the other uh, the Japanese haiku poets write the uh, you know the identity haikus. For instance, like uh, Masaoka Shiki wrote the uh, something like you know I, I I made a quick translation of that. It's me leaving, you staying, two autumns. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. and I think we, we forget that a lot. Um, a, a lot of times um, here uh, in English language haiku, we, we, talk, we do talk about Japanese aesthetics, but I think a lot of times um, they're misinterpreted. You know, we, we forget about some of these poems that are written by a lot of the masters. Like I said, you know, we have all of these collections of, of uh, poems from um, Japanese writers uh, on their sick beds, right? Well, they're yes. not out, you know, <laughs> going for walks and. Well, Masaoka Shiki was in bed for a right. long time because, yeah, due right. to his illness. So, yeah, so. Yeah. So um, I think instead of, you know, just focusing on, um, instead of trying to hit all of these marks, really um, just writing um, more authentically. And then making sure, you know, it, it has the the um, the haiku feel versus, you know, ticking boxes sort of thing, you know, the paint by number, mm -hmm. and you know, and I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining myself very well. You are. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Margaret. Well, you know, Issa comes to mind as well and then also how Issa you know developed as he went along as his life experience kicked in you know a lot of a right. lot of poems about losing his mother you know at an early age but then segueing into all the loss of his all his children and his father I mean you know he grew and developed that, that identity as he went along right exactly and I think that you know we should all kind of be focusing on um you know not just trying to write the one individual best poem but um, thinking about our entire body of work and, and you know, once be, we become comfortable pushing ourselves to go to the next step. Yeah. And, and figuring out what that step is on our, you know, it, to ourselves uh, based on our own experiences um, versus just something that is prescribed or someone on a Facebook group wants to... Uh, no Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> say that everyone has to have sort of thing. Um, I mean, honestly, I, I had that experience very early on um, in my own uh, writing journey. And I was in those groups for, you know, a couple of months and I'm just like, get, get, you know, everyone was telling me I wasn't writing haiku and um, well, they were wrong. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, um, uh, people coming to the community are, are, are very impressionable and they do need to learn, you know, haiku basics, but we need to think of it um, less, uh, less dogmatically, I guess. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at some of these comments. Can you please address Me Megs? Do you have suggestions? Um, well, like as far as um, how to analyze our own poems, um, I hoped that um, 
we'd be able to use the like the list of the signif uh, bleh, the the um, the identifiers that I had in the presentation, and I, I will have this as a PDF um, on my website if anyone wants to download it, and I can also include my notes so people can see all the stuff that I, uh, you know, I didn't want to overload the slides, but um, <laughs> Julie. Um, Could you include some of your own poems in the whatever we can download. I haven't, I, I, or introduce us to yourself now. <laughs> oh, um, my own. Um, well, I don't have any uh, right here. Uh, maybe I can find, um, maybe I can find some real quick. Uh, Do you have so your new resonance copy near you? You could read from there. Uh, okay. It's one second. I can just grab it real quick. <laughs> Sorry to put you to that. <laughs> and, you know, New Resonance, actually, this is something they do to uh, an extent. You know, all of the people who are in New Resonance, they, they do kind of connect these threads between the poems to help you get to know the work of the authors. Um, okay, um, this one was the, uh, the poem I won, um, the Peggy Lyles Haiku Awards. I've got third place, I think, and then I won a touchstone for this one. Um, Carving the Snow, Ulu Moon. Carving the snow, Ulu moon. A clay goddess, I mold the mythology of self. A clay goddess, I mold the mythology of self. Rain seed. I feed words to the cloud. Rain seed, I feed words to the cloud. When pronouns fail, the future of proto stars. When pronouns fail, the future of proto stars. And um, I'll read one more. Um, my lack of commitment, terminal schwa. My lack of commitment, terminal schwa. That's perfect. 